So now we're going to have a panel which is commemorating 10 years of the accountability initiative at CPR. So many of you may know, for, but those of you who don't, the accountability initiative has been on the forefront of tracking government spending and social policy in India over the last decade. And their PASA surveys and annual budget briefs have shed but light on the sometimes arcane area of public finance. So I'm delighted to invite the director of the accountability initiative, Avni Kapoor, and her panelists, Ratan Roy, the director of NIPFP, uh, Jeff Hammer, senior visiting fellow CPR, and Mr. T. R. Raghunandan, who is advisor accountability initiative and formerly of the IS. Uh, we are also expecting one more speaker, which we will announce shortly, possibly. Can uh, Ratan, Jeff, and Raghu come to the stage, please? A very good morning to everyone and a very warm welcome to all the panelists. Um, unfortunately, one of our panelists, um, Mr. Lokumar, suddenly has a government engagement. So most probably, he may not be able to join us. Um, but in case he gets free earlier, he, um, we've asked, requested him to join um, during the panel. Just to give a little bit of a context, um, Accountability Initiative started um, its work a little over a decade. And at that point, we chose to look at budgets, um, and particularly the flow of funds, as a lens to understand <coughs> state capacity. This morning, there was a lot of discussion on how do you, in, in some ways, track implementation. And we, at that point, decided that budgets is a lens, um, along with, of course, fiscal plumbing, um, that gives you a window of how do you understand what happens on the ground? And here, of course, I'd like to um, acknowledge Yamni, who started the initiative and whose very big shoes I've had to fill, but also our initial partners, um, both NIPFP, um, but also the Asar Center. Um, we're really missing Rukmini Banerjee here today, who unfortunately was not in town and couldn't make it, uh, because they validated for us the importance of actually doing this tracking exercise, even from an outcomes perspective. So the PESA project that Rohit just mentioned um, was in some ways a conceptualized together as a partnership of three organizations. But again, proved to us the importance of why this kind, this kind of tracking work matters. Um, and so today, in today's discussion, I think what we wanted to do was that it's been over a decade since Accountability Initiative started its work. The context has changed, financing structures have changed, institutional mechanisms have changed. So how relevant is actually tracking the flow of funds in today's day and age? And also, where do we go from here? Um, what does it tell you about state capacity? What does it tell you about the Indian state? And what does it tell you about how can financing shape outcomes? Um, before we start, I wanted to set a little bit of a context. Um, so we have a short video um, of some of the research that we have done over the past uh, 10 years. Um, so if you could just play that video quickly. Thank you. How and where does the government spend its money? The government collects taxes and it spends these to provide us services. And as a taxpayer, you should be able to track how each rupee paid as tax is spent. But can you? The government functions at three levels, the union, the state and the local level. The union government has the most yielding sources of tax revenue while most of the expenditure is expected to be carried out by the state and local governments. This leads to a situation called a vertical imbalance. To address this, the union government transfers funds to states. These fiscal transfers take place via three channels. The Finance Commission, Central Ministries and other discretionary grants and loans. States further transfer funds to their departments, local governments and to service providers at the front line. And so you would expect fiscal transfers to look like this. But this really isn't the whole picture. Funds sent from the union to states are also spent through autonomous societies that exist in parallel to state administrative machinery. For example, elementary education is financed through the education department as well as a specially created society to implement central ministry's education scheme. In addition, the union funds the same set of activities through other sources such as externally aided projects and MP local area development funds. Similarly, states also transfer funds through schemes, public sector undertakings and MLA local area funds. 
This leads to a fund transfer system that is fragmented and difficult to track. So you never really know where, why and when money gets stuck and how much reaches where it should. As a result, you can't track government expenditure and therefore you can't hold it accountable for the way it is spent. And when spending decisions become unclear, money is often spent with little consideration for ground realities. This explains why, for example, one school in Bihar had to spend its money buying fire extinguishers when it didn't even have a building. And here's the big secret. Even the government is unsure of what money reaches where, when and how. So each level blames the other and service delivery suffers. The first step to building an accountable system is knowing where, when and how money is spent and whether spending decisions reflect ground realities. Accountability Initiative's PESA project is an attempt to do just this. Through analysis of government budgets and expenditure tracking surveys, PESA chases monies allocated for public services all the way from when they leave the union government's coffers to when they finally reach schools, local governments and Anganwadi centres. Our surveys are done by volunteers and local communities, making PESA the first and only large-scale citizen-led effort of its kind. Visit our website at www.accountabilityindia.in to learn more about the complicated world of development funding in India. Thank you. data that we have in this video um, was through our surveys conducted way back in 2010 and 2013. Um, we go out to the field again now and we find quite a few of the similar, quite a few of the issues remain similar. As a public finance macroeconomist, um, why should we care about fiscal plumbing today um, from your perspective? And the movement of money, why is it important in today's context? Well, uh, we should care about fiscal plumbing, otherwise there's no point having a Ministry of Finance uh, there because the Ministry of Finance's job, I was just in, this was a popular line, I was in, uh, uh, I was giving at a public finance conference in London and I've often thought of finance ministries as if they're librarians. I mean, this is for older people, I don't know what libraries do now, but in my time, librarians kept books and lent them out. Now, I noticed across my university career that librarians didn't like to lend books. They'd give them to you under duress and then they'd want them back. They liked it when all the books were in the library. Yeah. Finance ministries similarly do not like giving out money. And uh, therefore, when you have a development imperative which forces them to give out money, then it is, there is no particular incentive for any ministry of finance to make sure it is well spent. Now, unless it's an ideological ministry of finance, and I've not seen that for a long time. That is, they're ideologically committed to spending money. But your run-of-the-bill ministry of finance anywhere in the world its primary object is expenditure control and fiduciary accountability. It is not uh, spending. Therefore, all ministries of finance, all, are satisfied once the money is deemed to have been released, hmm. expenditure released. And therefore, even uh, so-called lapses in the Ministry of Finance and attention paid to those are about release. This is compounded by the fact that when, as in the video you described, money that is released is not accounted for as having been spent. Even as in India with this city, but not city, the only thing we have, which is the UC, the Utilization Certificate. Yeah. Then finance ministries are under fiduciary obligation not to release more money. So if money has got stuck in one of the channels you described and not been spent, the finance ministries are under no obligation to you know, provide for compensatory funding. And therefore, it is very important to unclog these. There's one final reason, if I may, mm -hmm. which is that in a non-ideological development state, a purely technocratic development state such as ours, which is, if you ask somebody why should India undergo a development transformation, which involves asking what sort, they say, no, no, we must develop because we are not developed. That's not an ideology. That's a technocratic sort of linear pathway. So in that technocratic linear pathway, uh, when uh, money, when, when, when the picture becomes such as you have described, then there are entrenched vested interests who, are, who actually gain from money not being spent. And I don't know what these are. For instance, I do know that the government of India has about a 1 trillion rupee cash float today, you know, across its various spending departments in that mess you described. But what I find is there's absolutely no interest in unlocking that cash float at a time of great fiscal stress. 
which means to me, and this is something I've learned across my life, because nothing that government does is illogical. It may be perverse, it may be, you know, ill-intentioned, but it is not because governments are stupid. Governments are not stupid. I've not been able to unpack the logic of why this float exists. I wanted to ask Mr. Somnathan, and absolutely nobody wants to do anything about it. There is a logic there, and I hope you will find out. <laughs> I want to push you on one aspect of it, which is that currently, the, often what we are told, even mm. at state level, is that now technology can solve a lot of, the, at least the movement of money. Um, and of course, as you said, there may be vested interests to not, to ensure that float. Um, but we had a bunch of sessions yesterday mm -hmm. about the use of technology, both as an enabler. And from a purely operational lens, even with technology, you don't think that government has an easy way of actually just tracking the tracking expenditure and fund flows? No. Uh, the answer is in your own question. The government has at its disposal the means to track fund flows. But that's it. Technology is not going to help you actually make sure that the government desires to spend that money where it has asked Parliament for the powers to spend it. Right? Now, a very good example is my own... So, so government now has something called the PFMS, the Government of India, and most states have bought into it. So you can do tourism with PFMS if you want. Tourism is, you know, I can tell... I mean, they tell me very proudly where exactly how much money there is in each spending bank account of the Government of India. So if you ask, and then what? You say, well, I can tell. So I can make sure, now that I can make sure it requires more agency than an app. Okay, with great respect to all engineers in this country, as GST will tell you, as other things will tell you. You know, solving a problem of willingness is not going to be solved by, by converting India. India has bad governance. So uh, many of, I don't know about you, but many people think that we can solve this bad governance by creating, by converting the government of India into one giant app. <laughs> right? So you want food, take an app. You want this, take an app. If it were that easy, we would have done it. A long time ago, we're full of engineers, good and bad, in this country. But it's not an app. There are human beings involved. And so that, that problem of human agency doesn't go away. Uh, the problem of priority doesn't go away. And the problem of disincentives to spend, if not unpacked and made explicit, does not go away. True. You brought up the human element. And I'm taking my liberty of Raghu being an advisor. So not letting, not even easing you into the question and asking up straight, straight up front. You have taken you from your book title, everything you ever wanted to know about the bureaucracy, but were afraid to ask. Um, there are copies outside, so please do um, take one. Um, what are the ingenious ways in which bureaucrats tend to um, hide fiscal transparency? Oh, so many, many. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, uh, there are a couple of things I want to tell you. With CPR, I've been involved with accountability initiative right from the time that Yamini and I conspired about it before I left the government. And it's like family. And just like family, I get advice from them on what to say and what not to say. It's exactly like what happens at home. You know, if you head out for a party, my wife says, don't talk about this. Don't. So yesterday I asked her, I said, uh, do I make a presentation or something? Because there's some exciting, interesting research that one has done recently. She said, no, no, you only tell jokes. <laughs> and then just in case that I was not sure about she said, Yamini also wants that. <laughs> <laughs> so let me tell you. There are different ways in which bureaucrats uh, prevent you from getting information on data. One is uh, they provide data to you uh, in manners in which you cannot process it. If you go to the Karnataka website on panchayats, there's something called uh, the Panchatantra. So what they do is they give you data on incomes of panchayats in Excel. And they give you uh, the balance sheet, which gives you expenditure details in PDF. So you just cannot put the two together unless you hire a full army of people and spend crores of rupees on doing it. Of course, we finally hacked the website, because I put this out on Facebook. And so on Friday, I got a big data guy in Bangalore writing a private message to me saying that by Monday, he can hack it. So we hacked the data of uh, the, the, the NIC. <laughs> And got the data out. But then you know what the government did? The 5,600 panchayats, they made it 6,200 panchayats. So now the data is of no use at all because it doesn't pertain to the panchayat at all. The other thing that they do is they flood the data. Uh, literally. I mean, I, we were supposed to go to Tumkur district to collect data. And the previous evening, there was a thunderstorm. And the Women and Child Welfare Department had all the data. And they said, Bunny, sir, you can use the data. 
I went to the Women and Child Welfare Department, which is in the basement of the ba Bal Bhavan, and it was like descending into the Titanic or something, because there was water up to the top of the basement. And the sole computer in which the data was kept <coughs> inside that water. water. Right. And so I said, oh, the cloud, it must be somewhere on the cloud. You know, we Bangaloreans, the cloud and all that. No. What they do is they, they print it out, then take a JPEG picture of it, and huh? then send it to <laughs> government, uh, state government. Full, paperless, sir. Now, paperless. <laughs> so they sent it there, which meant six months time to collect the data from there. And the final thing is they will pull at your emotional strings. I presented this Paisa for Panchayat's report. You know, it's a great report. What we found is asked a very simple question. We said, how, many how much money is spent by the entire government in the Panchayat area? And we discovered that the entire government, through its multiple agencies, all of which are in that maze that uh, is there in the video, spends anything from 4 to 6 crore rupees in the Panchayat area. Sorry. In a year, that's what they spent. Hold, hold it. No, no, no. no. In, in a Panchayat in Karnataka, ah, where we did the research, it was around 6 crore, but the panchayat does participatory planning for about 20 lakhs. And if you add NREGA to it, it is about 80 lakhs. So the beautiful, we did a really good presentation, we did it to the finance secretary, and he kind of looked at me and said, Raghu, you want to make my life miserable? Hey, you are a senior in service. He tried all that IAS, you know, biradari stuff, and said, so two years after we made the presentation, they have committed that they will create a, a in-time, you know, real-time expenditure tracking system in Karnataka by a very simple mechanism that we suggested to them. We said put a location marker on every voucher. Mm -hmm. And they are doing their treasury computerization 3.0. So they said, Martini, we will do it. They haven't done it. Yes, they, they won't do it. Why would they do it? I mean, why would I make the life of the finance secretary? <laughs> miserable. Yeah. Tomorrow we will all be retired and I will be sitting in some club with him and then he will blame me. And so this is not done. That's not done. So these are many ways of uh, uh, doing this. And, and, the, and the moment that uh, you, 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 you kind of cross one bridge, then there's another thing. See, my wife is also in finance and she's retired. And since the last few months, she's been tracking the city corporation budget. And all that I can listen to, I sit on the sofa, she sits on the sofa, and there's a stream of four-letter words coming from her. And this is as she is going on the net and trying to get data. Uh, friends of mine have filed six RTI applications with the city corporation. You were talking about bank accounts. Every time we've got a separate report on the number of bank accounts in the city corporation. This is Bangalore, you know, Silicon Valley and all that. So I think the, the government has a big app, but it is called APE, the big ape. <laughs> Nothing is going to come out of it. Yeah, it's to be the of passbooks being lost in fires, in floods. Then now that we have technology and uh, computers, then data entry operators have run away with the password. Uh, of course, systems have crashed and there's no such thing as cloud storage. And I think for all of us at the accountability initiative, the amount of time we spend in just digitizing and just making that <coughs> data sensible, um, that I think that we often miss out on the interesting part of what is that story that that data is telling us. Um, because we just we just spend just too much time just literally filing RTIs, getting that information, then digitizing it, and then trying to find not hacks, um, but at least <laughs> trying to find some forms of OCR recognition. Jeff, I wanted to bring you here um, into this conversation, um, your, hundred, your, your 100 Homes project. Um, it's an innovative way of thinking of how do you merge data, but also how do you visualize it in a far more real sense. Um, so maybe you can tell us a little bit, both, from the, both about the project, but also from the data perspective of how did you go about imagining it and how did it, um, the, the, especially given the data hassles that we have, um, how did you um, deal with that? Oh, I didn't expect that one. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I'm happy to talk about the 100 Homes Project, uh, which is uh, uh, a photography, videography, 360-degree virtual reality illustration of the, um, of the Indian income distribution. Uh, we have 100 families, the entire uh, distribution of income. And we have, a, if you click, on, it's a website. 
if you click on a particular box that fills in the distribution, you get the essay of the family there. Uh, for data, yeah. I had not really thought of that, uh, some, uh, as, that this is a, it is a new way of, it's a different way of collecting data. Uh, a lot of that has not been explored as to what exactly you could do with it. I'm told that you could take a picture of um, a plate of food and there are artificial intelligence kinds of uh, techniques to estimate the nutritional value. That's possible. Um, but can I uh, go back to uh, uh, just the accountability yes. initiative part? Yes. Uh, I could see that pictures could help uh, with the accountability. But I think Rathen uh, answered a, a rhetorical question I was going to ask. The answer is, I'll tell you the answer before the question, <laughs> uh, is nobody cares. Um, the, uh, the, I've always been a big fan of the accountability initiative right from the start. Um, uh, what always struck me as bizarre beyond belief is that this had to be done by a NGO or an independent group. What the hell is the government doing? <laughs> uh, that, um, I'm actually opposed to the people, uh, particularly in my country, who say we should apply the private sector techniques to public sector uh, activities. I, it's a fundamentally different kind of problem. I don't even understand what the point was. However, when you get down to very specific techniques, there isn't a single business in the entire world. Uh, well, actually, they go out of business. Yeah, that's right. There's not a long-lasting business in the entire world that doesn't know where its money's going, what it's getting for it, and whether, and not just what it's getting for, that they can measure with, do people buy it? But did the supply actually reach the person who's supposed to, the store? Okay, so I think the accountability initiative was absolutely important for one of the two features of accounting, which it, sorry, of, of uh, uh, control, managerial control. One is accounting, where did the money go? But the one that is still not done is auditing. That is, the, we paid for the teacher. Uh, we know that uh, he or she got their salary this month. We know that pretty well. We have no idea whether they showed up for work. Uh, we have no idea whether they bothered to um, uh, teach the uh, dialect. We have no idea whether they, whether they treated the uh, students with respect or anything. We have no idea whatsoever. Brought them. Uh, 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 with, notwithstanding uh, whether the kids learned anything. Um, so uh, if, if we were trying to think of what business would ever try to teach kids stuff and have no idea whether or not it happened is really strange. So first was the money, second was the stuff, and uh, third was what, what the effect of the stuff was. Uh, we could go into... Um, <laughs> panchayats and what exactly they uh, have control over and what they don't. They, their budgets might be very large. Their discretion is negligible. Uh, and so one of the things of who cares is that the Minister of Finance may not care. Um, that in fact, they might like to avoid responsibility. But somebody should care, like parents or, um, or the pan, pan, parents through their panchayat or something like that. It's who cares whether the money is spent, who cares whether it's spent well, and who gets to say anything about it. Um, and that, I think, is uh, uh, where the accountability really lies and where um, a local governments have a, a bigger uh, role to play. I just want to add on that one is <coughs> the answer to that question is who cares uh, is who controls the money. Um, Deepak uh, spoke yesterday and says, well, the, the state is very effective because everybody comes and says, please stop, can I have some money? Um, when, in fact, it's their money. Yeah. So uh, the, the, uh, I think one of the real costs in India of an indirect taxation system is everybody wants stuff from the government and doesn't realize that they're paying for it. No, exactly. And in fact, what has been interesting and sad in the last few years is that, especially in the health sector, this link between the utilization and process and what happens on the ground has come up and made national news. Um, all the tra tragedies that came about, um, it, it, it 
it reminded us again of how important it is to actually understand who controls the purse strings, how do they flow, who has decision making powers. Um, just to follow up on one of your questions, I think one of the things that we have learned, and it's something that is often sad, is that when you have a health financing meeting, for example, um, you'll have all the finance people there, but not the sectoral experts. Um, and similarly, it works across sectors. Uh, <coughs> financing is often seen as a silo in itself, and then the sector expertise, so social sector people will not necessarily always look at the finances side. And I think one of the important points you raised is that actually, who controls the money has an important role in how outcomes get shaped. One of the things that we've noticed at Accountability Initiative is that when we first started, of course, we started off looking at it much more from the budget and fiscal lens. But over a period of time, we started looking at processes. There is this hidden world of processes and systems between what is allocated and spent and what is finally what happens on the ground. Um, how does one navigate that? Um, and who should be navigating that, um, especially given the fact that somehow in on finances, we often forget about the outcome story, and vice versa. Um, when we are focusing on outcomes, suddenly there is a lot of buzz on outcome mapping, um, but then you're not looking at the fiscal side. So even government formats often have physical and, physical and financial often as separated um, entities. But actually, there's a significant link between that. And I will get you to also respond to that after Jeff. Oh, well, <laughs> uh, uh, the main thing is somebody should look. Uh, uh, that is, uh, uh, you mentioned that uh, your st studies were originally 2010 and 13. Is that what? And they've been replicated yes. just now? No, we've, we've been doing it every couple of years. Um, well, I have a similar story, which is uh, absenteeism among teachers and doctors, and what do doctors actually do um, in their in their clinic. One's 2003, one's 2001, and as far as I know, those those have not been replicated. So we have no somebody has to look. Um, I I wouldn't recommend that you look using an RCT, which is only one way of looking. Uh, but uh, somebody should actually be paying attention. That, that should come first. Yeah. Would you like to also respond? Just in terms of the, why is it that we, when we're talking about finances, we're not talking about how they're shaping outcomes and vice versa? Well, <clears throat> in a technocratic uh, sort of development state, a developing state that has no particular ideology of development, if that extends to the political authority, then uh, I'm afraid there is no incentive for anyone to worry about outcomes, uh, as long as the outcomes are not bursting sharply. So if people are getting what they got yesterday and you want to give them more and they don't and no one gets punished, then it's okay. Or there's no rival who's promising to give them more. Uh, I have noticed that uh, one, therefore, what I'm saying is that I don't expect bureaucrats to care about outcomes, I mean, system-wide. Uh, politicians, though, ought to. And, uh, I have noticed with politicians that they care more about outcomes. I'm sticking my neck out here, but this is when it's not about public service delivery, but about cash transfers. So I noticed that uh, the PM Kisan business, mm. there was a lot of political attention given to whether the money was actually getting to PM Kisan or not. The, uh, the political attention, I'm not saying it succeeded by Amini, but they were worried about it. They were yelling and screaming. They don't yell and scream like that about schools and colleges. And, I think the reason for that is this. I think the reason for that is society. I think there's a, a lot of people in the political sphere have this take on us. And I've started doing this more and more instead of talking about the government. That we, the people of India, don't really care about public service delivery because we are not a cohesive society. So as long as my child is educated and I can find a way to do it, it's okay. So what we, the people of India, respond to most is if I make direct transfers to your bank accounts. And slowly, under the guise of Bangalore and this is efficient and all that, the discourse on public service delivery is shifting to a discourse where the state is giving you money. It's where I've called it a compensatory state. Now, when the state is giving you money and then you don't get that money, then the, the social contract between the two of you is broken and the public gets mad and maybe your electoral fortunes get you know, affected. And that becomes one sort of discourse. I saw it happening a little bit in Narega initially. And then people kind of gave up. People were worried about whether people were getting work in Narega or not. Because, in fact, unnoticed to all the other part of the Nega, which is if you didn't get work, then the state would compensate you, was ignored. 
So once people understood that, this massive scam that's happened in India, under the very nose of the bureaucracy, and, and, and we take no notice, uh, <clears throat> then people were okay. So it's actually, I think we have to reflect on this. Is this country, in whatever form, not some enlightened NGOs, really interested in educating its children as a collective? Are we really interested in the health of all Indians or just my community, my uncle, you know, wo ghar wali bossi ki health, and that sort of thing? Because look at the time and amount of energy we expend, and the government replicates this, on individual cases. So in my office, if somebody wants to get admitted to AIMS, I will spend a lot of time and effort getting that person admitted to AIMS. But as a collective, we don't worry about how people are getting admitted to AIMS. It is not a political issue. It is not an electoral issue. Government then takes signals from that and replicates it to you. So government tries to take DBT very seriously. Government tries to take PM Kisan very seriously. It's rather a matter that they fail. Failure and success is part of the job. It depends on how weak or how strong your state is. Questions of state capacity, which CPR will be cracking in the next three years. But the intention must be there, but the intention must be matched by societal intention, which I simply do not think is there. I'll be very honest with you. I don't think we care about the education of our young and the government response. Uh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Very depressing note. <clears throat> but, but one other thing, I think one an important fact, point that you made is that society, the society care. And that's where I have to bring in Raghu and all your work on decentralization. Where do you think decentralization stands today? Um, especially on the basis of first principles. Let's mm. just talk first principles. Um, in this current context, uh, what is its role? Um, and given the fact that we've always said that policy should be designed as locally relevant, we've always said that it's the local that should care. Um, government needs to be responsive to local needs. Where does decentralization stand today? It's dead. It's dead. It's completely dead. Absolutely. Because what has happened is that technology has become the substitute for decentralization. Exactly. And technology is instinctively centralized exactly. uh, because it is uh, very scale efficient. And you can see this across many areas. And I would think that uh, decentralization is deader in urban areas as compared to rural areas. In rural areas, there's always been the immediacy of personal contact. And I still think that it exists. And uh, you will still see in, in 6,000 panchayats of, of Karnataka, you will see I would imagine that about 15 to 20 percent of the panchayats actually run in the way that we would uh, we, we envision them to run. There is a discourse, there is conversation. There is uh, actually also supervision of work that is not done by the panchayats. But you take Bangalore city, it's dead, dead as a dodo. Uh, it's only a lot of ineffectual noises that are coming out of NGOs and they cannot do anything about it. We've got the wards committees constituted. There's absolutely nothing happening in the wards committee. And let me tell you how that has been engineered, using technology. See, the Bangalore City Corporation declares a budget every year of 9,000 crores to 10,000 crores, knowing fully well that it cannot collect that much of resources. But the mayor sanctions work for 9,000 crores and 10,000 crores. Then in October, there's a small news item which says that the budget is revised. So you would imagine a revision of 10%. In a revised budget? No, it's reduced to 3,300 crores. The best that we have got to is 7,000 crores. In the meantime, works of 10,000 crores have been sanctioned. And then the mayor changes. Every year the mayor changes. So these works have piled up till you have 35,000 works on hand, ranging from several years. So nobody knows how much money is spent on which work. And now, you know, the other exciting thing that has happened that the expenditure budget of the Bangalore City Corporation has certain committed expenditures. Hmm. Right? There's interest, there's pension, there's salary. Then there is something called works. And you know what has happened to the, to the works budget? It has been converted into a slush money budget. The chief minister, the, the minister in charge of Bangalore gets 150 crore as a personal pocket money to sanction any work which he or she wants which is the reason why no chief minister of Karnataka has ever given up the Bangalore city, uh, the minister in charge of Bangalore city portfolio. Right? The mayor has got a slush fund. And to keep bureaucrats quiet, the, the, the commissioner has got a slush fund. So, the, so with the slush funds, they spend money and you will not have the granularity of the detail at a ward-wise level. Now, we've been talking about creating ward level budgets. I mean, this is a no-brainer. This is something that all of us have been talking about, right? And the NGOs are just working themselves up into this terrific frenzy. 
and they have absolutely no way of finding out. But I'm pushing you again because you said, okay, in the urban side, it's a different picture, but the rural side, you do have a revival. You have Gram Panchayat development planning um, that started. You have the Finance Commission now giving more money to Gram Panchayat. What about the rural side? No, no. The, 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 see, what's happened is that bureaucrats have been like salivating, uh, looking at all these largest going to rural areas. So what they've done is they've tied it up. And they've tied it up by saying that you can do whatever you want to do, but I will issue guidelines. So we've just finished the Kerala report, which you are, you are, is under publication. You know what they do in Kerala? They send money to the Gram Panchas because they have this reputation to protect on being this champion of Sachin Tendulkar of decentralization. So they send the money down and then they, and then they starve themselves because they have to send the money down. And then they tell the Panchas, say, yeah, you can spend whatever money, whichever way that you want. But please contribute from that money towards Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan. Because I cannot afford to pay my 40% component of Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan. So a lot of the money is given with uh, on the one side and then it is guided back into state control through uh, another side. And if you tell this to any 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 Malayali, they, they feel, because I'm a Malayali, they think I'm a traitor to the state. These are the kind of things that is happening. And uh, what is happening is, Surprisingly, the public are not really very concerned because they have all kind of reconciled themselves to this subaltern status and they run around uh, negotiating their power by understanding which pieces of this jigsaw puzzle they have control about and they are concerned only with that. So they negotiate their way through and there is really nobody in the state or even among civil society who wants to think through this whole thing and kind of uh, re you know, rescue decentralization from technology. What do you think, Jeff? You've written about bot bottoms up and the need for far more decentralized framework, especially in the health sector, in order to get reform done. This was quite a few years back. No, nothing's changed, right? <laughs> um, uh, in one respect, I want to uh, disagree in the most vicious terms with my good friend Raghu. In order for um, at least the 73rd Amendment, the, r the rural areas, to be dead, you had to have been alive in the first place. <laughs> Oh, and, that's a good point. And, and that I don't think uh, was never was ever uh, uh, taken seriously. Um, uh, in Karnataka, so Karnataka and Kerala are good examples. Uh, you're, you're familiar with both. Yeah. Uh, I asked uh, Mr. Vijay Anand in, from Kerala, uh, big champion of uh, of the power of Grand Panchayats. I'm sure you all know. If the school building roof was leaking, and um, everybody thought that was a serious problem. And they thought, you know, the health of, of people has been OK. We don't really need the extra uh, examination room right now. Could you, in fact, move some money from the health part of the budget to the education part of the budget in order to fix the roof? And the answer is no. No. <laughs> um, so as uh, uh, so uh, uh, as far as tons of money go through the Grand Panchayat, but they but they have to pay the teacher and they have to build this and they have to do that. And even when the World Bank gave small bits of money to the uh, Grand Panchayats, the state government clawed it all back um, instead of letting the Grand Panchayats. Uh, do it, what they wanted with it, uh, building the boundary wall, walls of schools uh, and building Grand Panchayat headquarters, which nobody in the planning in the in those planning sessions or in the Gram Sabha ever mentioned, um, uh, so that we paid absolutely zero attention to what anybody in the Gram Panchayat actually wanted. Okay, so we're going to do one more quick round of questions before we open it up to the audience. And I'm hoping to end this discussion on a slightly more positive note, or at least thinking through what lies ahead. Um, we started with the micro, and I think now moving back up um, between the center and state. Um, we've seen the last few years significant changes in center-state relations, um, at least in terms of the financing story. Um, and I'm directing this question um, initially to you, Ratin. Um, you had the Finance Commission, the 15 Finance Commission has also, again, devolved funds to um, increase the devolution of funds to states, um, in keeping with the, what the 14 Finance Commission did. 
you also have the center now playing a role in providing sector specific grants so um, the interim report talked about a nutrition grant um, for example um, that is given across states um, you have of course from the revenue side the gst what do you see as the role of the union government in social policy financing going forward i have a contrary view on this i hope people here will not take it amiss i need a very good reason for the union government to be involved in anything absolutely anything other than defense internal security and the railways i'm not saying they should not be involved i can even see the political compulsions for them to be involved to asking me this as a technical question i need a very good reason the traditional good reason given is equalization of services across the country but that i'm afraid the state governments are doing themselves very conveniently and this is very puzzling so if you look at the history of state finances over the last 30 years you will find that uh, two things have happened one the states that have grown in terms of per capita income maharashtra karnataka gujarat have actually shrunk in size and the states that are poor are both fiscally prudent and are better collectors of own tax revenue <clears throat> that the states that are rich the states that are rich are below the average own tax revenue collection they also spend less <clears throat> in simple terms what that means is what you all know that if you live in maharashtra my own state and you live in a rich part of maharashtra konkan or desh or something your healthcare education you know uh, sort of uh, quality of service is going to be maybe 10 15 maximum 15 15% 20% more than uh, bihar or rajasthan it's not like going to be 300% more and as a maharashtra asked this question if i'm three times as rich as bihar how come my health and education quality of public service is only 20% better than bihar i have the answer for you the rich states have seem to have a compact i don't understand this where they simply begin spending less once they grow rich as a percentage of gdp so over the last 30 years if you look at uh, sigma states states spending as a percentage of gdp it's about it has grown from about 14% in 1990 to 21% now but in that <coughs> the rich states have shrunk mm. and the poor states have uh, increased so <coughs> again we the people it looks like we don't want our states to spend more money on health and education even when we grow rich so the case that i said i when i grow rich i or the bells of showed it sorry it is not working in india indians are taking conscious decisions in parts of india which are growing rich to spend less on public services i think a very very important research agenda would be to try and find out why this is happening and how this is happening Yeah. No, we have <coughs> seen that in fact that as as the GDP increases, the uh, expenditure on social sector in particular falls. Uh, And the tax GDP ratio falls. So they actually give away money back to the rich. <coughs> so what can we do? So I think Ratan has laid out a useful research agenda for all of us to um, follow up on. Um, Jeff, how can we fund more innovatively? Um, and how do we kind of break this? dichotomy that exists of like increasing centralization decentralization is not always i i am not going to use the word dead but it it may not be in the forefront right now um how do we bring it back how do we uh, and as a research organization what should we be focusing on uh, i'm glad you added that last part <laughs> as we as a, a research organization because i was going to ask who is the we in this <laughs> sentence um because if it is the federal the government central government is if it, it nothing they're not going to do they're, they're not going we are not going to do anything <laughs> however if i were to recommend uh what you in <laughs> uh in uh uh your role as a, a research group um i okay i don't want to be depressing okay yeah um, positive note yeah um is show by example what can be done So I actually would uh, encourage the auditing uh, addition to the accounting part of hmm. accountability initiative another part of accountability um and uh actually track not just the money but what uh what becomes of it. Um now it's possible that no one will give a uh, will care. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh but uh uh I I think um uh making this public and well known could not hurt okay <laughs> and raghu last words both as i think um as a proponent for many years of decentralization but most importantly right now as a advisor to accountability initiative 
Um, we've been doing this exercise, and we I think we will continue to doing continue to do this exercise. Um, I think we have taken cue from what you said of just expanding it from just a pure fund flow story to looking much more at even the administrative architecture, um, because I think a lot lies in who's structured where, power relations, um, who's accountable to whom, and um, so. What do we, so we'll continue to do this exercise and I hope you continue to join us in this journey. But how do we, what next after that? Uh, one thing is to say, okay, we're putting out information in the public domain. We are being transparent about it. We are um, having conferences like this to discuss big ideas, um, to solicit feedback. Um, but how do we get people to care <laughs> um, a little more about it? Uh, well. Uh the first point is that uh, while I agree with Jeff that uh, you need to study outcomes, the problem with uh, doing the complete gamut of research up to that point is that you are going to produce far few research papers. Mm -hmm. And if you produce research that is good <coughs> quality with consistent <coughs> looking at outcomes, studying it over a period of time, you would be producing quality reports once every two years or three years, by which time the political advantage or the meaning of that for the people who have to negotiate uh, on a daily basis will be lost. So I think one of the things that we will have to do is that even as you are uh, you know, kind of progressing along the larger, on, on the uh, longer uh, you know, term, looking at research, doing consistency checks and so on and so forth, when you find that you've got something that is really very useful for people, I think you should connect up very quickly to people. There must be intermediate releases of information in a, in a nice way, in a humorous way. And I must tell you that, you see, it's not, when I say decentralization is dead, I mean that the, uh, that the government responds to decentralization, the government design of decentralization is dead. It is, I wouldn't still say that people don't care. There is an incipient desire amongst people, particularly I see it today amongst urban people, very naive. They are much more dumb as compared to rural people in even understanding the layers of government that govern them. But there are people who are coming out helplessly and saying, you know, can you do something? Can you produce a what level handbook? We need to engage, we need to do something, we've got these ward committees, and so on and so forth. And then there's a roadblock. At that point in time, can accountability initiative come in and give them pinpointed advice, pinpointed information, with a bare minimum of consistency checks and saying, you know, this is where we stand at this point in time, why don't you go and ask these questions? It is this, so what happens is we have major research, we have long-term and medium-term, you know, kind of targets in terms of producing papers that can be published, peer-reviewed, and so on and so forth. But there's also this sneaking out of information to people who can actually make a difference. And I would still put a lot of faith in the political lot. And uh, I, I don't mean uh, even sitting MLAs and sitting ministers. <coughs> they are like the finance department. Once they have knowledge, they don't want to share it. But they have competitors. They have all kinds of competitors and aspirants within the same political party outside. If there's one gentleman standing or a lady standing for election as a corporator, we are going to have city corporation elections. So we produced a handbook, completely a voluntary effort, produced a handbook and printed it and published it for two wards. And now there are requests from 60 out of 198 wards saying that we need similar handbooks. Because people prefer to have that rather than something on a phone. So you, if you can tap into that, then your research will be a lot relevant in actually causing practical change on the ground. Thank you. Lots of good advice to all the researchers in the room. So I'm going to open this up for audience questions. Um, I will be very strict, so please keep your questions short. Um, and let's avoid comments. Um, I think you, I'm volunteering that if, if you have a detailed comment, then we can maybe talk to the panelists after the session. Sure. Um, and so. Go ahead. Hi, so my name is Shubham, and I've been part of a research organization for the last two years. Uh, we have discussed about public financing and how it is linked to the outcomes. So the question that I want to pose here is of attribution and contribution. Let's say, in a, in, just for an example, in the case of a health system evaluation in Uttar Pradesh, where you have multiple financing from the state government, from the external funders, from the donors from an organization in US, how do you actually, and all of them are actually trying to reduce mortality in the state. So how do you then track this whole funding and its attribution within the attribution of the mortality through the public uh, expenditure? That's my question. Do you want to collect a few? Or yeah. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. 
Any other questions? Yes. Um, thank you, and I hope uh, you as the chair and the very learned panel will forgive me for asking a question as a naive uh, urbanite, and that relates to the uh, the cash subsistence or subsidy that is given to children studying in the government schools. And based on my um, regular constant sort of interaction with my domestic staff based in Delhi and those whose families are in Jharkhand or in West Bengal, I find a totally differentiated kind of a feedback. Money is going to J in Jharkhand, West Bengal too, not so bad. Delhi is a scandal. The parents know it, the children also know it, because now they know their entitlement that they must, they would probably be getting as per their age group and their gender, whatever. So what can be done? Of course, some excellent suggestion of auditing to your initiative. There is also a kind of, uh, like an NGO that, you know, this awareness building. But this is such a simple thing, but this is such a universal problem. And as, uh, as an urbanite, you feel so helpless. Once I suggested to my mates, I And they say that everybody is scared, everybody knows, but nobody can raise these. And there's a kind of a nexus between the banks and the schools. So I don't know, it's a very simple question, but it's a very um, serious problem, I think. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Hi, I'm Archana Chaudhary and I'm a journalist. And I actually had intended this question for uh, the person from Niti Aayog who was to attend. But since he's not, I'll throw it to the panelists in any case. We've been talking about money flows and uh, how the government is funding its various uh, uh, schemes, the welfare schemes. When we, I wanted to understand what happens when we bring in corporates into this mix. Because this government has been trying a new experiment. Uh, the Niti Aayog had announced how aspirational districts were going to be, you know, we're going to have private companies and uh, private trusts coming in and doing, helping out there, funding certain government projects. So how does that change the mix of money and transparency, if somebody could address this? Thank you. Should we do this one round and then take the next slot? So open to the panelists. Yes. Yeah. Who would like to uh, take uh, Well, questions? I can only answer, uh, address one question, which was the, um, uh, the, the collection of, of data um, one of the things that's always been frustrating for me is that if you wanted to link the money to anything else, there was, there was really no way, no way to do it. Some things were uh, 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 measured at, at district level. Um, uh, some things were measured by uh, the catchment area of a, of, a, of a hospital or a school. There was no connection between the two. Um, and that uh, uh, there was no single way of, of connecting uh, those dots. And uh, it's not that it's never been brought up before, uh, uh, but there seems to be resistance from someone, I don't know who, uh, um, for, for, making, for making this uh, uh, regular. Again, a, pro a project of the World Bank uh, to Kerala, uh, Mr. Vijay Anand wanted to know what the money that he was giving to Gram Panchayat was doing. And that needed systematic uh, evidence at Grand Panchayat level of what was coming in, and then at least a few things uh, uh, coming out. So actually looking at the world and measuring something, um, I know correlation isn't causation, but lack of correlation certainly isn't causation either. And um, uh, that would have been very helpful. The World Bank said no. I'd like to take the question about corporate support. I think it's uh, quite uh, quite ineffective, and it sets up a lot of perverse uh, incentives. See, what happens with corporates is that they want instant gratification. So they would like to invest in things that are tangible. So if there's no school building, they would build a school building, and they would put their name on it. But they would not want to put money into encouraging people to investigate why the government is not building a school building, why the government is not spending more on, on such things. I've also found that sanitation is a kind of a magnet uh, for, for, for people. They just, corporates just love to support sanitation. And then there's arbitrage. What happens is that uh, you give additional subsidy. And so the toilet looks just a little prettier, a little better. They are very happy. They bring along a minister and have the toilets uh, inaugurated, which reminds me of a joke. But I'll tell you that later. Uh, but um, 
so what happens is that the person who is building the toilet actually pockets the government subsidy. So you have uh, kind of a double income for the individual. So there are, th I, I would uh, be very careful about bringing in uh, corporates. And I have gone to corporate funders asking them to put money into accountability and always fail. Hmm. Always, without an exception. They say it's too political. We don't want to get political. Yeah. So, I have a very simple take on this corporate question, which is a good question. So, what is a corporate supposed to be doing anyway? Just remind ourselves again. So, it's making money, no? They go out, they buy things. What is the government supposed to be doing? Providing public services. How does it fund it? By taxing corporates. So, if corporates are that interested in doing social service, give me more tax, no? Yeah. Just give it to me in tax. What is all this CSR bullshit? I don't under I've never understood this. I just do not understand this. Your job is to make money. Go and make more money and give me more tax. That was the social contract. Now suddenly you want to build toilets uh, because your uh, auntie or somebody has to be given a garland. I don't know what. I mean, I don't want them building hospitals. I want them to give me tax. I'll build the hospitals. So first we have to figure out why the corporates and why Niti Aayog, I mean, forget Niti Aayog, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, is interested in this kind of, you know, uh, other than for sort of socialite reasons. I know you get page 3 coverage and all that and that IS officers love. But uh, we really have to go beyond that. Somewhere we have to grow up. We can't run public policy for page 3 all the time. <laughs> On the question of attribution, my question is how does it matter? So let me give you a very simple public financing framework in this. The normal default assumption is if I spend more money on something, I, I get more outputs. And then you may ask whether those outputs are necessary to get better outcomes. But first you have to be very clear about the equation. Spend more money, get more outputs. Spend less money, get less outputs. If that is not working, as yeah. you so rightly showed, then the question becomes not of attributing which money did not go where, but why you're getting less output when you're spending more money. And uh, once you answer that question, then you can go to attribution. If you're asking at the second bureaucratic level, that how do I you know, attribute UNDP money to outcomes? I've worked in UNDP for about 17 years. I can show you how to do it. It's not difficult for anything, whether we have outcomes or not. I can show you how to do it to satisfy management. That's a simple matter. Yeah, just wanted to take the point about your education subsidies, the yeah. cash transfers that are going. Uh, Yamini will bear me out because she doesn't much like the content of that book. But there is a book <laughs> called uh, just, give, uh, just Give Money to the People. Hmm. And this is kind of a pseudo, uh, it's a little bit of a populist kind of a description of it for the lay person on how subsidies are supposed but there's one example in that about uh, about conditional cash transfers uh, going to children in i think it was chile if i'm not mistaken where the money was given to the parents uh, on the ground that the child would have 80% attendance in the school and while that target was achieved uh, the story was still open on whether that affected educational outcomes but that was not the objective of the cash transfer in any case but it, what it also did was it led to a perverse incentive of uh, mothers giving up jobs and sitting at home to ensure that their children went to school because that way they got paid more than what they were earning in the, at the jobs. So there are, you have to be very careful about cash transfers and what exactly you want to achieve through cash transfer. And the other point which in the Indian context is something which we need to worry about is if you don't put any, and you cannot put conditions on expenditures of money that goes to people, then you can have this unholy alliance at the local level where the person, you know, there's some kind of, you know, you give me a bribe out of this and I will look the other way kind of thing that can happen. So we have to be a little careful about cash transfers in the Indian context. And I don't know enough about uh, it to say whether there have been recent changes in other countries to overcome some of these problems. But the fact remains that that book does describe also some success stories in, in, in cash transfers. Whether it's backed by good research, I'm not sure. One last quick round of questions. Yes, go ahead. Okay, two questions. Hi, uh, my name is Rajeshri. I work with Climate Policy Initiative, and we are also working on a similar initiative with the Shakti Foundation to track green finance flows in India. So, uh, my a uh, very immediate question to the panel is, on a very practical uh, level, do you have any suggestions for, uh, say, for example, the way budgeting is done? Because I, I know for a fact that there are budget codes and there, are, there, there is a way that uh, budgets are done. And that's probably one of the ways of how we can uh, improve accountability through budgeting flows. So is there a 
gap that you have found that can be improved upon. And one more question. Yes, go ahead. Hi. Uh, I don't know if the question is more of... Huh? If you could introduce yourself and... Right. Hi. Uh, my name is Gurjot. I work with a, like as Yami described, a do tank in the education space. Uh, I, I would ask more for a comment from the panel. It's been very insightful so far. It was mentioned that, um, I think Jeff mentioned it, that he spoke to someone where if the school's roof is leaking, could you move funds from that's been earmarked for health to education to kind of fix that problem, but that's not quite allowed. Because otherwise, I'm assuming that would hold, uh, open a whole Pandora's box of misappropriation of funds. However, it still happens, right? Where they somehow find a way to do it. Where there was this some uh, report earlier, a few months ago, where the Beti Bachao Beti Padhao program spent a very significant amount of its money only on PR and publicity. And I was in a conversation with someone deep in the government and asked them, well, this fund was released to the State Education Society, but then it never went anywhere. What happened? They're like, oh, well, the CM just announced a farmer subsidy, so the money had to go there. And I was like, but is that even legal? And they're like, well, it's not, but what can you do about it? So the money does move around verticals somewhat illegally, so, but it's not allowed. So uh, any comments on sure. that? Comments? Yeah, uh, on budgeting, I would, I, I, an ideal situation, there should be four things that should happen when you do budgeting. What, at least a part of the budget should be done bottom up. I would not say 100% of a budget can be done bottom up because there are certain things that have wide area externalities for which planning has to be done at a higher level. Number two, uh, budgets have to be realistically, uh, you know, large. Today, what happens in almost all departments is that you get a circular which says increase your budget by 10% over last year and they just prepare a 10% more, staple it and send it out. That's the second point. The third point is a budget is open to revision because you really cannot predict revenues. But the revision has to be done in a reasonable space of time after the original budget was declared. Right? Government of India still has a good system by which the budget revisions happen in October. Right? The Bangalore City Corporation revised previous year's budget in July of the current year. Would you believe it? The year is over and then they revise the budget. And the fourth is whatever and whichever manner that you might make a budget, right? you must have real-time expenditure details being put out. I don't, let it be raw data. Raw data which is interoperable, which can be drawn out, everybody else will do the analysis. But put the voucher level data out. Government has the capability. Treasury computerization is one of the real successes in India. They just don't want to create a public expenditure portal. They just don't want to do it. And that is the problem. Now, can I tell my I joke also? <laughs> Two second joke. Yeah, that's about the inauguration of toilets. You know, we had a chief minister in Karnataka who was quite a maverick. And he was called to inaugurate a swimming pool in, in Bangalore. And he comes with... Uh, you know, a Hindi villain style of uh, dressing gown and he takes it off and he's in his swimming trunks and he jumps into the pool and he swims two laps. And after that, there was a discussion in the assembly. So some opposition MLA got up and said, sir, we have public toilets in our village. Why don't you come and inaugurate it? Oh, but the classic point was made by the leader of the opposition. He said, I've got an electric crematorium in my country. <laughs> <laughs> One second responses, we're completely out of time. Yeah, uh, I think to your uh, question on budgetary codes, what I would say is that, and, and to yours, I can answer them both together. <clears throat> there is nothing wrong with the architecture of Indian uh, public financial management as such. The architecture is quite amenable to the kind of reforms we want in, in public financial operations. So, for example, with the government, it's quite right that if Parliament has voted money for a particular purpose, you have to be accountable to Parliament if you want to change that purpose. But you can do that four times in a year. It's, it's not first supplementary, second supplementary, and then the RE. So three plus the actual budget, four. Uh, there are also residuary powers that exist at the level of the cabinet to undertake the technical word for it is environment from one place to the other. But I think what you're doing and what you're seeing here is one thing that you've got to acknowledge, and we all have to acknowledge. The Indian state is not strong. It's a very weak state. So a lot of the lapses and failures that you're seeing in public financial management are coming out of an acknowledged Horrible acknowledgement, it's, like it's like a functioning alcoholic, you know. Uh, acknowledgement within the brains of the governments of India that the state is weak. That's why you see in some states which are not weak, you don't have this problem. 
that acknowledgement cannot be made in public. It's like almost admitting to alcoholism. And therefore, you have a weak state that continues to manage it effectively and is afraid of putting out evidence mm. that it is weak. So I would say yes. the government of India, when it does not put out a public expenditure portal or the de Department of Revenue, when it does not put out taxation information in the public domain, is not not doing so because they are doing some scam or something. It's simply that it will then hold up a mirror to performance and that mirror nobody likes, we don't like it. And therefore they will not put it up. Last words, Jeff. Uh, uh, this gentleman gave me another example for uh, ignoring uh, local desires. Yeah, whether it was legal or not <coughs> to transfer money from one thing to the other was for public relations purpose. I'm pretty sure that no one in any of the villages related cared one little whit about whether or not the state paid for its uh, public relations. It, it, the, the big issue is that none of it uh, responded to, to people's actual needs or desires or whims <laughs> or anything. <laughs> Thank you so much. Please join me to give a big round of applause to the panel.